um, the way I wanted to kick this off was basically by running through a few stats that I read this morning, just by getting you know um, up to speed with all the latest. Um, and then, of course, you can chip in if there's anything that I've missed or anything that could be relevant in this case. Mm-hmm. So Epic Games, uh, which are, of course, the video game developers, are closing 2020 with a $5 billion revenue. Uh, Fortnite, which is, you know, uh, the one of the games of the franchise, uh, that's where gamers have spent more than 3.2 billion hours playing Battle Royale mode and generating 400 million in revenue just during the pandemic itself. Uh, Fortnite itself have hosted, of course, everybody knows uh, Travis Scott's virtual concert, which almost reached 12 million views and uh, which is just to give a bit of context, uh, probably the average of a daily, I don't know, or, or one of those weekly NFL games or same thing for football here in Italy and TV. Uh, with that concert itself, he gained more than $20 million, which is 10 times more the average of one single concert the previous year that he would do physically, talking about Travis Scott here. Call of Duty is another you know, game of the franchise. I'm actually, out of all of these games, probably Call of Duty is the one I'm most familiar with. Uh, registered 60 million users in the first half of 2020. 60 million users, again, to put that in context, that's the whole population of Italy. And then, of course, given these numbers, uh, gamers have basically become celebrities, stars. So there's Ninja, that's one of the most famous gamers who earned 17 million in 2019. That's mainly, of course, between uh, sponsorships, between Red Bull and Adidas, for instance. And then he's got, uh, he's around 14.5 million followers on Instagram. PewDiePie, which is probably one of the most famous, uh, the one I, that I was aware of, he's got 21 million followers. And again, to put that into perspective, and because I'm calling these guys celebrities, is because Donatella Versace, which is, you know, perfectly who she is. She's got 5 million followers on Instagram. Uh, And then we talk about fashion. So uh, Louis Vuitton, uh, they had this partnership with League of Legends where they created five bespoke looks that could be bought on the platform itself. And again, to give a bit more information to our listeners about League of Legends, that's the game whose final was watched by 100 million users in uh, 2019. Uh, which is basically the same amount of people who watched the Super Bowl uh, final game uh, in 2020. Jeremy Scott also developed in 2019 a capsule collection for Moschino that was on the Sims video game, which is a video game that actually was playing when I was younger. I think it was early 2000s. Uh, really had fun with uh, Barbary. was the first brand to have a fashion show streamed on Twitch. Gucci signed a partnership with uh, Tennis Clash just recently. Bottega Veneta, Craig Green, and Dior have all uh, had their collections uh, on Animal Crossing. And then while all of the above might seem like gimmicky PR stunts, uh, there's a report from Quantum Tech Partners. Uh, the study basically has estimated that the investments that will be injected into the esports industry by 2022 will be around $4 billion. So all these numbers, basically to justify the reasons I decided to get in touch with Karina, then Azim, thanks to her, and then thanks to her again with Alexander uh, to discuss this subject. And to put it a bit more in perspective, I think the way I would like to, uh, who's listening to see the three guests, uh, they would be probably owners of three areas of expertise, but they all cross each other, of course, because all of three have quite a wide knowledge on the on the subject. So Alexander, for instance, he's more focused on tech and blockchain. He's director and business developer of Engine, which started as a gaming community uh, with more than 20 million users. Then a couple of years ago, went through an ICO raising almost $20 million. Um, they basically have this blockchain ecosystem that can be used uh, by companies of any size to basically create some new digital products and assets. Uh, Alex, you want to tell more about your background and how you got there? Yes, yeah, so very much. Um, my background, uh, my professional background within the technology industry uh, was actually as a technology consultant for the professional services firm mm-hmm. Accenture, 
Um, so I uh, very, very deep in sort of technology project management, uh, starting with heavy enterprise overhauling backend systems and moving much more towards agile uh, deployment of some really exciting new technology. Um, but that, that kind of professional experience made me really excited about and enjoy bringing new technology to existing businesses and enterprises and um, basically being able to see you know, the expertise that they've brought to their own industry and the knowledge they have but being able to be that input of a new technology a completely new way of envisaging processes and um, leading to kind of new and exciting things uh, perhaps <laughs> it's a manager consulting speech but uh, that's what i really enjoy and uh, i left accenture actually to leapfrog that process um, and get my hands dirty with the emerging tech of blockchain um, and through some uh, exciting adventures I got involved with Engine and was really excited about what they were doing and saw the fact that these NFTs, these non-fungible goods that we refer to as um, in place of blockchain assets, that's they're really just the placeholders, um, actually all of the blockchain terminology are placeholder terms for what will just be the digital goods of the future. And blockchain is going to be completely subsumed and it's going to be normal um, and everything that we're talking about the special now will be the norm because blockchain brings so many uh, amazing qualities to virtual goods so that, that's the angle i'm coming up uh, from you know, blockchain is new it's cutting edge but it's so so relevant um, and uh, now more than ever looking into 2021 uh, we can see how the future is taking shape with it. At the Absolutely. Uh, and from now on, you're going to be the blockchain guy. <laughs> <laughs> Fair Azim, enough. On, on his side, he's coming as a head of partnerships at Daglet. Is that how you pronounce yep. it? Yep. Okay, so it's a location-based mobile game. Basically, uh, they like to defend themselves like the Pokemon Go for sneakerheads. Uh, his background, though, is completely diverse. I know you, you got a background in biology. Do you yep. want to tell us more about it? Yeah, so uh, I I got a bachelor's and master's in biology from Boston University uh, and I was going to be doing medical school. I, I was working at a biotech company in 2012 and 2013 where we were doing antibody sequencing, which uh, strangely enough is extremely relevant to everything going on now with COVID. Uh, but yeah, we used to do antibody sequencing uh, and then reproduction of those as well and I ran the Boston Marathon that had the bombings in 2013 and I was living in Boston at the time too during the lockdown and so it was just like a, a time where I really reassessed uh, exactly what I wanted from life and if I wanted to go to medical school and I decided that I didn't want to and so I rescinded my applications for medical school and I quit my biotech job and at the time I'd been working part-time on just like a, a fun tech startup that was allowing people to license photos and videos on their smartphones. And so we <laughs> decided to go full-time into that. Uh, we did really well in the press in Boston. And so we ended up raising angel funding not long after I quit, which thankfully gave me some income at the time. Uh, and so since then, it's been, it's been a, a strange road uh, because, of, because of the marathon, I ended up becoming a contributor with the Huffington Post. And... Mm -hmm. decided to start using that contributorship at one point to start interviewing hip-hop artists just because music is a big passion of mine, hip-hop music in particular. And over time, ended up building quite a repertoire of artists that I had worked with. And and so, you know, years later, uh, ended up meeting one of the executives at Rock Nation who asked if I was interested in starting an esports company with him. And... And at the time, I was running a dev shop where we were building stuff for athletes and artists as well. We worked with Kanye West, Tiana Taylor, Bryce Remmert, Bryson Tiller, Dreamville Records. And he asked if I, uh, if I wanted to start an esports company. So for the next two and a half years, you know, we worked out of Rock Nation, but we were not Rock Nation. We were like an incubated company, essentially. And we did talent management of esports professionals. We hosted live events. Uh, we worked on mobile games for some of the artists at Rock Nation. And also we did just like scripted and non-scripted content as well. And so it was a, an interesting experience. And early 2020, actually this year, I'd been introduced to Ryan, who's our CEO at Aglet and was told about just this Pokemon Go for Sneakerheads idea. At the time there were a stealth company. They hadn't put out anything and I joined pre-launch just because I thought the idea was brilliant. And I see 
so many of the places it could go. And now, you know, very fortunate and blessed to say we've raised $7 million since the company was started. Uh, we, you know, have a, a nice hefty user base. We've worked with Gucci and Stadium Goods and having conversations with a lot of other big brands and just excited to see what the future of the metaverse holds for us. I think metaverse is a good keyword that we will definitely deepen later in the in the conversation. And also, you're probably going to be tagged as the nerd during sports expert. Perfect. Sorry for Perfect. that. <laughs> and then uh, Karina on the other side. By the way, uh, all you guys' experience uh, very matched up well, which is something that came up really by chance, thanks to Karina, uh, which introduced all of us. Uh, so she's co-founder of the, the Materialize. So I'm, Karina, I'm going to talk about the latest project. Cool. And of course, you can do the introduction to yourself, which is basically an authenticated virtual goods marketplace that can generate new revenue streams uh, for the fashion industry. Uh, her background, though, is initially as a visual merchandiser. Is yes, that it is correct. So you're going to be the, 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 the fashion <laughs> Yes, I would be happy to play that role. <laughs> You did a lot of um, um, lecturing, mm -hmm. right? Is that, is yeah, that yeah. Right? I, I spent, um, I've been lecturing for about 20 years uh, and now I do it as a kind of adjunct or kind of affiliate professorship role at different fashion schools and business schools. But you've got a lot of a sorry, background in marketing too, I've seen in digital. And yeah, general. I just, uh, I, I've, I've fallen in love with how I guess technology can be used as a way to amplify and make people experience stories, whether they're there are their whether they are their own, like as in a personal brand, or whether they are from um, a fashion brand or um, a non-profit, anything like that. That just kind of gets me excited. Gotcha. Um, let's dive into the question. I have one. Uh, I think the best way to tackle this would be to start from the mm. basics. Uh, and I'm sorry, Alex, for the very basic question, but I think we should really break down what blockchain means and the NFTs that you mentioned before. Uh, if you give, could give us an example of these versus maybe, I don't know, cryptocurrencies that we normally are uh, aware of, such as, uh, I don't know, Ethereum and so on. Yes, yeah, so definitely. Well, the, the best uh, the best starting place often for most people is, uh, you for better or for worse, uh, Bitcoin and the idea that blockchain allows you to create something like a digital currency because for the first time you can create digital items which have proven scarcity and proven authenticity. There will only ever be Bitcoin and if someone else you know, comes to you with a Bitcoin, you can prove if that is a real Bitcoin or if it's something that they've created themselves. But within the, the space that we're talking about and within the space that Engine operates, we're looking away from the sort of cryptocurrencies, um, which we would call fungible goods, because you can break them into sort of smaller pieces and they're all, you know, $1, one Bitcoin is the same as one Bitcoin. Mm -hmm. um, and look at non-fungible tokens, which are more unique goods, which is really what constitutes most of our world and existence outside of currency. Um, and so when talking to people who work with virtual goods and saying, well, how is blockchain relevant to you? Uh, the way I describe blockchain is really at its most basic. It's a decentralized agnostic database uh, right. for recording ownership. Um, so the, the idea being that in um, a game like Fortnite, which I'm sure we'll be talking about uh, quite a bit, um, Nike launched a digital only sneaker, digital only um, Jordan Air Force, I believe. Um, and you can buy it and you can own it and you can use it within the space of Fortnite but it is stored on Fortnite's own centralized sort of user and inventory management system. Okay. And if that ownership is recorded on the blockchain and this external database that everyone can see and read and write data to, then another game like Player Unknown Battlegrounds can say, aha, uh -huh, this person has already bought a digital Nike shoe from Nike and paid to you know, unlock it in Fortnite. Um, but you know, I want to attract that user to wear that cosmetic item in my world. And Nike is going to want their customer base to you know, show their brand allegiance in all the virtual spaces they operate. And so you know, they will be very happy for that Nike shoe to be worn in play on in battlegrounds. And when that user comes back to Nike, they can point to the blockchain and they can say, look, I own this digital shoe in Fortnite. I own this digital Nike shoe in play on in battlegrounds. And 
you I would like to unlock a special uh, perhaps a discount or a, spe or a special skin on the Nike store itself. And for me, that's the magic of the blockchain. It allows conversations and collaborations that wouldn't be possible because you have this, for the very first time, you have this trustless, um, forgery-proof database that everyone can read and write and collaborate over. That seems like the, um, for lack of better words, uh, the biggest challenge in this specific instance seems to be the fact that in many cases, many game owners and game developers might not have the interest to put anything back on the blockchain and so keep their worlds as close as possible. Is that is that a real challenge? Is that what we're facing at the moment that's keeping us from getting into the scenario you just described or uh, there are already instances where this is possible and how do you first no, see that going no very 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 much um this is something that uh, I, i interact with many game designers and they've said look this vision is is really exciting this is something you know i've i've, I've always you know believed in and wanted to strive for but when you work with game designers they are incredibly into that they work and speak within their own teams and uh, when they do socialize they're very possessive of uh, of their sort of, of the creative output what they're working on because I enter space where you know creative ideas can go a long way and they can be very valuable um, so I think within the games industry breaking down those walls is very difficult however what always excited me about um, blockchain items within the gaming space was actually not the the magical sword that you can take from game to game mm -hmm. not the cross game questing and these are These are really cool uh, innovations. They're really exciting, and they're going to lead to amazing adventures in people's second and third and fourth lives. Um, however, <laughs> much more significant is the cosmetic items. It's essentially being able to carry your identity and your personality, or a part of it, between the different virtual spaces you frequent. And if nothing else, 2020 has been one of the years where you know, gaming is no longer seen as you know, playing silly games. This is actually acknowledging that these are virtual spaces, these are 3D social platforms where people are interacting, they're collaborating, they're creating, they're socializing. Um, and it is so much more than just this sort of gaming label. Hence why we're seeing so much investment coming into what is perhaps you know, before being seen as the gaming space, because these are the platforms and the spaces where you know, the future economies, these huge virtual economies are going to operate. And as a result, the it's the cosmetic items, it's the brand names that is going to push blockchain into many spaces. It's going to force these worlds to collaborate because it is big brands like Nike who will want their consumers, their customers wearing and showcasing these brand symbols and these cultural allegiances in all the spaces. You, know, If you're a Taylor Swift fan, you'll want to wear your Taylor Swift 2017 tour T-shirt in all the places you frequent. Maybe not a sort of... Uh, bash them over the head RPG like Mortal, but uh, <laughs> perhaps in you know Minecraft and Fortnite. That, that is an element of your personality you will want to carry around with you. And similarly, you know, if I'm doing very well in Covet fashion, I want to show that off to my friends in, a, in another space, but perhaps not again, Mortal. Um, but that's, that for me is why this is a really exciting intersection because it is the fashion element. It is this maturing of not just the blockchain technology, but also the technology to allow creators to create beautiful pieces that move between virtual spaces um, that is going to lead to the adoption um, and the, the perseverance of the metaverse. I see. Um, but I think, uh, I think Azim will want to go, go into more detail on the metaverse side of things. No, exactly. The, I was actually going to interrupt because uh, you mentioned something like people gaming, playing online and so on. They're, they're basically living online. And so that's where the intersection between real life and digital virtual world is, is really really uh not, not so well yep. defined and now it's going to start to become as blurry very very blurry um and as Imber earlier mentioned the world metaverse uh and i would also talk about here we're, we're gonna get a bit philosophical <laughs> here i'm sure uh there, there's a lot of um um interesting uh repercussions of this and interesting questions that pop into my mind that are more related to what the future of humanity will be once this blurred line actually completely disappears and becomes a uh, it will be very hard to distinguish the real versus the, the virtual world uh, hence the simulation theory 
uh, brought up also by Elon Musk recently and so on. So Azim, on your side, how do I actually convince a 50 year old director in, in any brand, in any company, uh, that physical and virtual are based Yeah, so company? honestly, it, this is something that Ryan and I have spoken about a lot. And the way, and Ryan's the CEO of Aglet, the, the way that I see it is, yeah. and, and this is what I've told him is like, the idea of real versus digital is almost like this metaphysical question of how we define what is real. And we're going through a phase where the younger generation is redefining what is real. And so if you think about people, and I've seen a split where after the age of 40, and not everyone, but for the most part, what I've seen is around the age of 40, people have this difficulty comprehending the idea of digital first and digital only items that have real real value, like expensive items. And what, what I've sort of come to in having a lot of those conversations is I bring it to the idea of a Rolex. Uh, what is the innate value of a Rolex versus a Tudor or a Timex? What is the value of a Ferrari versus a Kia? What is the Fer what are the value of, of Gucci versus Walmart? The or or a, a, a really good job title. Uh, any of these things, what they do for people is they confer a certain level of status. Uh, you know, you if you have a Rolex, you have a Ferrari, you have a director title at a company, whatever it is, there are things that all of us do to, to, to be able to, you know, essentially it's status as a service, but we utilize all of these things for status. And because it confers status within and among our peer group, we, we identify that as real because in reality, the difference between a Rolex and a Timex is literally nothing. And because they're both meant to tell the time. And so the way that I've looked at it, when you speak to a lot of these young children, what you see is that if you have the skin from season two of Fortnite that was really hard to get, that confers the same level of status. With Aglet, we've seen it. If you have the first batch and the number one shoe, even if we made a thousand shoes, if you have the first one in the first batch, it confers a certain level of status. You can flex that on our Discord. Or mm -hmm. on, yeah, within exactly. that community, right? Yeah, within Is your communities. It's just that those communities are growing because as of now, the young people who are so immersed within digital are gonna grow to be 25 or 20 or 30 or 40. And when they do, they're going to carry this same understanding of these digital items being just as real because when they were 13 years old, it conferred a certain level of status. And if all of those people who are 13 now, when they're 25, digital only items will do the same thing. So it'll be the same difference between the Rolex and the Timex. Like, you know, anyone, anyone wearing a Rolex, you, oh my God, nice, nice watch. That's so nice. Yeah. And so, that's the biggest distinction that I've seen when I speak to executives at companies who just don't get it. I try to explain it using that sort of analogical thinking. And I found that it's the best way to get them to understand it. Sometimes they don't really have to get it. They just have to embrace it, which is what I experienced. Just bring up an, uh, an interesting uh, episode there. Uh, I lost a lot of friends out of uh, World of Warcraft uh, because basically when I was going at their homes for studying or to convince them to go out and go play football on the street and things like that, they were locked on the screen uh, trying to get as many, I don't know how, how the, the points were there, so basically get their, 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 their character to the highest level possible just by playing hours and hours and hours and already back then we're talking about 2005 so i'm talking about it as if it was 50 years ago but basically it's 15 years ago uh but still uh, you know playing online wasn't a big thing yeah uh, such a big thing back then um you would go on ebay and you would be able to buy someone else's character but that was already, I don't know, if the maximum was 100, he was like 98 points and as a level, and you would be able to play with that character and impersonate that character. Uh, and so people were craving for those and actually be able, they were happy to spend money to get those upgrades. And uh, same thing, and because what you have there is people committed into a community whose status for them is very important. So when you wander around and within this virtual world, people see that you're, you know, 
wearing a Rolex, which is made of experience points, uh, the people would respect you. And then uh, that's, 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 that's yourself in your second life. Uh, as Alex mentioned before, it's yourself in, uh, in another world, which is uh, basically in most cases in someone in, in most people in some of the gamers lives most of the time spent living rather than uh, in the outside world so to them there's no distinction yeah and I, I, if i can just maybe add something in there as well that i think there are a lot of brands who are <clears throat> maybe not yet thinking about the the power of digital twins and being able to have a digital version and a physical version um, and whether you sell them separately or whether you sell them together um, something that's happening a lot in my conversations with brands is that they're saying what do you think is that what do you think the impact is going to be on physical sales and I'm like I don't know yet and that's that's the that's the real honest answer <laughs> but if you look at kind of what's happened to music and, and um, I suppose traditional luxury, you've seen kind of analog and craft like raise in value, and I think that that will continue to happen. But obviously, also I want to be an advocate for the the raising of value of the craft of digital as well too. You're a, you're a great advocate also of uh, crypto as a means of exchanging uh, collectibles. Yeah, and well, I say I'm an advocate. Uh, I'm right? a frustrated non-consumer because um, actually you, you may or may not find this surprising, but as yet I don't have um, a crypto wallet and I don't have crypto. I am going to get one in 2021. So at the moment, I'm not able to partake in this mm -hmm. amazing crypto art revolution which is happening at this moment where there's so many amazing digital artists and it's actually quite surprising that fashion is being kind of like so slow to to embrace kind of NFTs. It's really only been in the last um, two months specifically that we've started to see them getting press and even still that's been kind of more within some of the more specialized um yeah yes yeah. i'll give you and my so point on that soon one of the reasons that i'm doing what i'm doing is because i want to normalize uh, or kind of democratize the ability for people to purchase or get involved with nfts without having to have a crypto wallet hmm. gotcha on the uh, late comers from the fashion world, which is one of the neatest and probably most uh, rational transition or connections you would make from 3D, which is, you know, I have an avatar, what's the first thing I think of? What, what can he drink? No, what can I make him wear? And so um, here's how it's going in, in my personal career path uh, for the fashion world, like 3D is just now being introduced in some in, in some areas apart from some you know uh, uh say leaders in the industry that are already embracing 3d since five ten five eight years uh thinking of uh, hugo boss thinking of tommy hilfiger they are you know their 3d models and renders already in the design process and so you would start from the design process then you would introduce that into the prototyping process this would this this uh this uh then this area, mm -hmm. I would call it cost-saving, uh, context of 3D and virtual. So virtual as a cost-saving instrument. Uh, then, then there's sampling. So again, instead of, you know, normally for a prototype, you would have to brief the supplier, wait for a week for the, for the item to come back. Uh, then maybe you have to change a button, you send it back to the supplier, it gets changed again, that's another week. And so you can imagine yeah. how this is sped up by 3D because you can do it at, at basically at, at the instant. And the same thing goes for sampling. Once you have the sample, you have the virtual sample, you don't have to shoot it anymore. You don't have to wear, uh, you don't you know, have to dress models anymore uh, to, to do the fitting uh, because you can do that already in 3D with 3D avatars to see how it stretches, uh, how, um, how there's tension points in the, in the fabric and all these things can be done in 3D with uh, specialized tools. Once you have this 3D model, you get into the virtual showroom environment where you're now using it as a means of sales. And now it's started to be blend again into a new, another world, which is not anymore a cost-saving world, but it's actually generating revenue. So in these instances where 
with a, a fashion industry, even the luxury space that is going at such a high speed, and we don't even have the time to produce collections, uh, 100% of them, because we have to go into the fashion show and then into into showrooms uh, to sell as as quickly as possible. Sometimes we don't have the whole collections sampled, and in that case, having the 3D to you is a is a way of finally showing to the customer, in this case, that be a B2B customer, um, the Harrods, uh, the uh, Saks Fifth Avenue, uh, showing them your items in it with a new added dimension, which is, a, which is a 3D one rather than the photographic one. And nowadays, the level of realism is really high. And now to answer your other question, I think where we haven't tapped yet, and I think many uh, fashion brands are failing is because they haven't introduced 3D right enough. And so 3D to them is not embedded in their DNA as a means of prototyping and creating those items, but mm. it's just a, a marketing gimmick where they produce content that is, you know, okay, we have the collection, we have to shoot uh, a new a new advertising campaign and we're, we're going to do it in 3D. Yeah, no, that's cool. Uh, in, in, inside, inside Stella, there are younger generations like 3D as a, as a means of communication. Perfect, let's use it. That's where it stops. Uh, that's not embedded in the DNA of the brand. So where, what I, the process I'm trying to do, for instance, in my perspective, but I think is going to be the right process in the same way, I don't know, community management and social media management got embedded into marketing and communication teams within the companies rather than outsourcing to external agencies is and nowadays, 3D and virtual has to become uh, basically the core format where uh, the whole collection is produced because then you already have the whole collection designed in 3D, which is when you now get into the realm of uh, new revenue streams. Now I have a 3D model. Let's put it on the market and how can I make it generate more revenue and to your question earlier you said okay some people are asking me how does that make me make more money in the real world actually the question should be well now that i have the 3d version how much money more can i get in the digital world and actually that leads i think it's a, it's a good connection into the next question which is uh what can i do with this 3d model once i have it what are the many things i could do potentially I mean, I, I can answer it, but I, it might maybe be interesting to be good for, for all of us because I don't know, um, Alex has is, is kind of got a, a great example just recently from this. But um, I mean, from all of our yeah. research yeah. pre launch for dematerialized, when we, whenever I spoke to consumers, consumers said, and I'm talking about regular consumers, uh, not necessarily gamers, um, like regular consumers off the street, they all said, I want to see the digital garment on me. And of course, ideally, they said, I want to see it on a video mm. of me and I want to be moving. And at that point, I was slightly crying and saying, OK, well, the tech's not there yet for that. But um, I think it's interesting that the, unless you are speaking to a gamer, the, the first response from the end consumer is that uh, they want to they want to see it on a on. We're interested and we're back to this real version. Um, and then after that, of course, there is uh, porting it into a game. Um, we see as well, like the obviously, mm -hmm. um, blockchain is part of um, dematerialized with Luxo, and with that, the, the kind of crypto community are, are so hungry to. There's such an appetite for NFTs at the moment to kind of purchase them as something that's a, a collectible, and is that something they might want to trade in the future. Um, and one of the things that I think is quite interesting in, in, within this space is no, there's a, there's a white space I see um, for where you display like your NFT collection. It, it's something with Dematerialize that we're um, working on again with, with Luxo with the Universal Profile. But I'm really interested to see where that will go mm -hmm. in the future as a way to um, well, hopefully be able to wear it in Aglet, hopefully be able to um, sell it um, with a, a marketplace powered by engine potentially as well. So it definitely needs to have the, when you're selling it to brands, brands are like, what's the utility? When I'm selling it to consumers, they're like, I just want to see it on me. Sorry, that was a long answer. <laughs> mm. Oh, gotcha. Alex? No, that, that, that's um, those, those are all really exciting um, projects <laughs> that uh, I 
been great to reconnect with <laughs> Corinna Beatty and, li- and listen to you talking through those um, because yeah, few, loads and loads of uh, you know, ideas sparking in my mind. Um, I think lo- lots of conversations we have to pick up in 2021. Um, but I won't bore listeners uh, with, with, with that excitement. Um, I, I think for for me, the, the interesting part is uh, still blockchain. The, the technology means that it's very good at proving ownership of a of a token that, that then you assign to some um, you know, some value or some item that sits outside of the blockchain. We are seeing more projects mm. place all of that metadata around the token onto the blockchain, and it's quite expensive to host a lot of data there. So, for example, these are projects which maybe have unique pieces of vector art, um, which is cheaper to you know, store on the blockchain, and then that that um, asset can be pulled uh, from blockchain data into different worlds and games and projects. Um, but that's that's kind of very simple and you know, very very far away from the the high quality. You know, close 3D files and the like, um, which we're seeing being could you split at the it into layers? And um, so, the, I'm just thinking out loud, you could you could you could split it into layers, um, and you could find ways to even make that cheaper or make it more effective. But there's then there's uh, two kind of um, two kind of divergences there. On the one hand. Um, which is kind of comes down to can you take the asset, mm. can you scrape the asset, um, and can you stop anyone who doesn't have the token interacting with it? And on the one hand, blockchain and the, the huge surge in crypto art um, at the end of this year has shown that people care about authenticity and they care about that that closeness, that proximity, that um, ability to touch you know, an artist and a creative that mm. they really care about. So everyone's saying, well, can't you just screenshot the NFT? Can't you? You know, just right click and download that GIF or that video. But people are putting a huge amount of value on having something that you can be traced back to being held in prove it's yours, ownership, yeah. um, of the original creator on the blockchain and prove its authenticity. But I think um, so. I think that goes a long way to just introducing new sort of like cultural and societal norms where we do value authenticity um, over you know, the our friend on Animal Crossing who's just put together their own Prada <laughs> dress within the, the game stash and creator. But the preventing people from you know, being able to rip the asset, put it onto BitTorrent, um, you send it around the world, um, that's that's a kind of another challenge which is really exciting because it ties into how we deliver those clothing yeah. files, for example. Um, so essentially, if you have a high quality fashion designer, um, the digital designer with engine uh, has been privileged to work mm-hmm. with the fabricants over the last month on a um, Atari yeah. inspired collection um, kind of drawing on Atari's sort of history. And so the fabricant are producing these really high quality uh, clothing files in Clo 3D. Um, oh, we're using the and same, by the way. They can make incredible videos with them and uh, apply them in different spaces. Uh, one thing they do is they send those assets over to a project called Dress X, which allows people to pay to have these items digitally tailored onto real world photos. So really sort of high quality, you need the, you know, the highest possible assets. When you're taking that into a game, there's the issue of you know, porting it into a game engine like Unity, how are you going to simulate the fabric, how are you going to rig it on an avatar and an animation. And those are your know, hurdles which have basically blocked this from spreading very far. But we're seeing huge advancements, not only in the technology, but also in the infrastructure and the ecosystem that exists behind mm-hmm. these virtual worlds. Um, and by that, I mean, for example, um, there's a lot of companies that now specialize in avatar creation, being able to take even a single selfie or you know, a 3D model of a person and turn them into an avatar that can then you know, perhaps be a very basic 2D cartoon character in one world or be a more photorealistic um, avatar in another world. And when you have pieces of infrastructure like that, pushing avatar technology into multiple different virtual spaces, if you can tie your you know, 3D cosmetics to that, to those infrastructure pieces, then that's a way to push content into many different virtual spaces. And um, tied into that is the fact that brands are pushing themselves into games. You mentioned earlier all of these collaborations between big gaming brands and esports and large fashion houses. And ultimately, it's all about eyeballs. I think um, the news came out this week that we'll see esports um, at the 2022 um, Olympic Games. And uh, mm-hmm. if I'm, I'm wrong there, I've, um, it's been a busy, busy holiday break. But that, that's really exciting. But that was always going to come because 
there are huge numbers of people engaging in esports and as Adeem mentioned earlier these are communities where people care about you know achievements within that community and the status within the community um, and as a result we're seeing you know, in-game advertising uh, becoming a huge thing. Brands want to be in the right virtual spaces in front of the right audiences um, and again that's another piece of infrastructure that is taking the creative output of brands and pushing them into virtual worlds um, and I think at that point when you can have the high quality, the high fidelity uh, asset by someone like the fabricant sitting outside of the virtual space but being pulled um, in what the industry would be called a high definition render pipeline into the gaming world uh, automate how it responds to the physics and the, the designer style. Yeah, the style and we'll have to convert it somehow. And um, that's when you can, yeah, but that's where you can uh, prevent the asset being scraped, but essentially have people be able to interact freely within the different spaces uh, they go to, but protect that original file. Um, and that's where things do get really interesting because only the person holding the blockchain token can have the pleasure of enjoying the asset within a certain digital crucial. environment. Uh, I was double checking. So Intel has announced uh, that they will have the Intel World Open, which is an esports tournament that will take place on the lead up to Tokyo 2020. So the, the tie is there, but they're not like it's not going to be part of the Olympics. As, 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 as it's guerrilla marketing. <laughs> um, I was just double checking. Uh, okay. Yeah, yeah exactly. Yeah. Uh, but I think it's uh, <laughs> somehow they're going to be co-sponsoring each other or something like that. I'm going to have to read more into it. Um, Azim, on uh, your side, uh, we, we've talked about a lot about esports. Um, how can I explain how much of an entertainment platform it has begin, begun, uh, become? Considering that when I think about esports and I talk about esports, people would think of nerds who play, and they're not thinking of probably the other angle, which is you know honestly, I think one of the biggest things is that people need to break up gaming and esports into two separate things. One of the really like well, well mm. known and well said facts among anyone in the gaming industry is that the gaming industry last year and just about every year uh, for a couple of years now made more money than the music and film industry combined. And that's a massive number. And then the other thing is, is that understanding the difference between casual gamers and hardcore gamers. Because if you play Candy Crush, you're a gamer. If you, you know, like anyone who's, if you, if, if I don't know if any of you guys played Among Us, Among Us has been huge the last couple of months. Uh, if you've played Among Us, you're a gamer. And so a lot of these very hyper casual games make people into gamers and the esports thing, I mean, when you look at like esports or just like streamers, if you add up the number of minutes watched for someone like you had mentioned Ninja earlier, so we can just go with Ninja. Uh, I know that uh, his, his management mm -hmm. company, his old management company is a company named Loaded. And one of the founders of it had been talking to me about how people had watched ninjas like the, the stream I, ha I have to verify these numbers but the number was in billions of minutes and that there had been more watching of ninja streams in minutes than the total number of minutes watched for like one of the avengers movies kind of a thing and so and it was just like it's such ludicrous numbers <laughs> that I, I can't even recall it because i was sitting there and i was like this one guy who lives in a suburban part of illinois is racking up minutes compared to the most popular Avengers movies. And so, you know, talking to anyone is, I mean, you know, you're, you're in Italy, Fabrizio, like how much do people watch soccer? Uh, and why do people watch soccer? Because there's something that, you know, people enjoy and then there's competition in it and certain people are much better than other people. And it's enjoyable to watch people who are very competitive. And so, the same reason I, I watch basketball, right? Like I'm, I'm no LeBron James, but I enjoy watching <laughs> basketball. And so in the same way, when I speak to older people and they're like, why would you ever watch someone play video games? I'm like, why would you ever watch someone play sports? I'm like, you know, and like, that's the simplest thing. Yeah. But then if you want to dig into the numbers of it, the growth of gaming and esports as a whole in the last couple of years, the double digit growth across merchandise across non-endemic advertising across uh, media rights across ticket sales obviously 2020 not included because of covid 
Um, if you look at the numbers in all of the major parts of what's encompassed within the industry, we're seeing explosive numbers that you don't find anywhere else. I know that there was a report released recently by the ESA, which is sort of like the top lobbying uh, company of the of the United States. For the, it's like the I don't, know, I don't know what they stand for, but they said that the amount of gaming related jobs in the United States as of that day was this report came out a few weeks ago was a little over 140,000 jobs and the average salary of someone in that industry was 120,000 US dollars per year and that's not that that wasn't including like the gamers and the streamers and the professionals this was just people who work in the industry Activision Riot all of these things if you think about 140,000 jobs at $120,000 salary and this isn't an industry that's like leveled off by any means. This hasn't stopped growing. This is actually like no one understands how much it will grow because seeing these double digit growth numbers across every sector of the business is so crazy that they can't stop hiring. So it also keeps improving. It doesn't just yeah. grow in terms of numbers. It just improves in terms of of quality. Like think of a video game yeah. twenty years ago. Think of a video game now. Uh, like here, you're here in another, another world, example of like it. I found this out today universe. that PlayStation Five or like where can I get a PlayStation Five kind of thing is the top ranked thing on mm-hmm. Google for searches for the entirety of 2020. So over COVID, over toilet paper, over mm-hmm. anything was how can I get a PlayStation Five or PlayStation Five. So, you know, if you go on StockX, which like, you know, it's all about sneakers and, and hype beasts and everything. If you're subscribed yeah. to them, I mean, just about every week, you're getting an email for like related to video games, PlayStation 5, uh, you know, Xbox Series S, like gaming related things. So like, it's just, it's consuming the culture. And the best way I can put it, especially as someone who spent time in the music industry, is that 20 or 25 years ago, Parents used to look at young kids and they said, what are you doing listening to that noise when people were listening to hip hop music? And it was just like, you know, now parents are saying, what are you doing playing those games? So it's just the new form of, of youth culture. And as people grow into it, I mean, we see hip hop runs the world now. And so 20 years from now, we will see the seeds of what's being planted today where gaming will rule the world. I still, for those who are criticizing um, people watching people playing video games, I think uh, they're, they're, it's still a better hope and, and, and a better f- future that I see there compared to people watching people unboxing uh, toys and uh, eggs. Which, which was a scary trend I was seeing. And uh, I have a two-year-old wow, child. Wow, so two years old are already fixated at it. On YouTube. Yeah, he, well, he's a gamer. Like, he plays, he's got his games on, on the iPad. And he, he's, uh, that's, that's, that's it, it, it's his natural environment, honestly. Yep. I don't give him more than one hour screen time a day. Uh, but he, he spends it half <laughs> with uh, Paw Patrol and the other half game playing, basically. Yeah. Which I think is a good exercise for his mind, so I don't mind, honestly. Absolutely. It's, it's, it's going to be the future, so he has to get used to it. Uh, and I don't think we can understand how much that is going to be important in the future. Um, the other uh, topic, actually, we talked about with Karina, about the cost saving versus new revenue generating streams. Um, I think in, uh, just to close the loop, because we were, were almost, well, almost close to an hour now. So I really thank you for the huge, huge level of knowledge you guys dropped in the past hour. And also <laughs> actually without any prep. So <laughs> it's it's incredible how this came naturally and uh, as all the, bit, the, the best things, they actually really come when uh, um, chaos is allowed, at least at least a little level. Uh, is there anything you guys on each one's side want to uh, pop up that I think, uh, do you think is relevant? Maybe each one of you. So let's start with Alex and then uh, go down and back to Karina again. Ooh, I, 
I'm I'm gonna <laughs> let someone else take the bullet there. Um, <laughs> to give, to give me time, right. give me a moment. I can go. Uh, I can go my, because my maybe will be. we didn't talk about it um, totally, but I, I I think there's similar to these other kind of battles that we're fighting against about. Um, and it's a it's an ex- experiment I'm planning to launch in 2021, is to simulate um, two kind of fitting room environments basically. So one fitting room is a traditional fitting room with a mirror and physical clothes. The other room will be a magic mirror where you try on digital clothes. But I'll try and normalize as many of the conditions as possible, i.e. same brand, um, et cetera, et cetera. And what I want to do is um, measure the um, different emotional reactions to that try on experience because this is something that um, we had kind of raised before was that I, 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 I fundamentally believe that that digital um, the experience of, of digital consumption and usage and browsing um, is, can be visceral and it's something that um, even in the beta version of creating the dematerialized um, is one of the things that we wanted to try and play with so for instance when you uh, arrive on our on our site you um, you arrive in a 3d world that doesn't have any kind of like there's no ceiling and there's no floors and it, it gives you a slight feeling of being a little bit kind of like disembodied hopefully in a positive way but also just to try and make that mm-hmm. dif- distinction because i think a lot of fashion brands in particular when they've tried to do digital things or create digital metaverses or digitalize their showrooms have gone very literal and I'm not saying that that's wrong but I guess one of the things that to me that's so exciting about digital is that we can we can do stuff that's not possible in the physical world and I think we've just not even come close to to doing that kind of stuff so that's something that I'm really, I'm really excited about and then I also just personally want to create some more data around demonstrating to people who haven't tried um, digital uh, fashion experiences that it, that they are genuinely I don't know sweat inducing or heart rate pounding <laughs> It makes me think of, um, you know, there's um, people having lucid dreams and thinking of the uh, it as being a, a huge opportunity of elevation because you get into a world and you do things in, in, with infinite mm. possibilities, but with the capabilities of your human brain. Um, and then you just mentioned the fact that in the digital world, you basically got infinite opportunities of uh, expanding what your experience is. Uh, so basically, we're, 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 what dreaming is potentially could become reality, <laughs> being living in the virtual world. So exactly. Um, yeah. So I think, as you uh, uh, on your when site? it comes to this, there's uh there's a lot of conversations around the metaverse or the virtual world that we're going to live in. And many of them are based on like this idea of like snow crash or ready player one. If you guys have read Mm. either of them where there's going to be this one major metaverse Mm -hmm. that everyone goes to and everyone lives in and everyone does everything. in. but everything that I'm seeing indicates that we're going to have a bunch of different metaverses for different communities, for different things, the same way that we sort of have now, where like, whether they're subreddits or they're discord servers or Roblox. Yeah, or Roblox. I also think about, sorry, that exactly. Dolly Parton I agree with you. where you have your digital identities all kind of slightly different. Yeah, exactly. <laughs> exactly. So like, I think <laughs> as much as people are sort of pushing to like, see like, which company will be the metaverse company, I think we're just going to see a bunch of metaverse companies. There's no way that Epic Games is not already, you know, especially with what they did with Travis Scott and the capital they've raised, the the money that they've been making, that they're not working towards taking Unreal Engine and creating a metaverse as well. But I just see them being part of a metaverse of which there will be many. So I'd say that's the biggest thing I see looking ahead. 
So we're talking about the expansion of social networks, which are basically uh, interest-led communities into uh, augmented and uh, richer digital experiences. So not one unique big social network as we, we've experienced now, we have many uh, with different characteristics. In the same way, you'd have uh, different virtual environments in which you'd like to live uh, the life, uh, depending on the kind of interests you have or uh, the type of games so. you like my, to play. I do think so. My perception on that from a consumer totally. perspective is that we'll, like, our brain can only handle so many met- metaverses or even just like platform. I'm sure like all of you all have multiple platforms that you use for um, different client projects or different stuff. And so I think there, w- there will be a threshold for people in terms of the amount of metaverses that they can handle at once and also I, I guess it'll also my my gut feel or prediction is that it'll also be you'll go through phases of metaverses almost like as mm. you go through like phases of um I, I guess the kind of different cultural things yeah yeah I could, see that. could be at the beginning <laughs> but then uh Neuralink <laughs> is going to come into play and you're going to upload your brain into your a virtual machine and so your your capacities will be expanded and so you're going to be able to be ubiquitous in all the metaverses game over and that won't be frustrating for you I look forward uh, to that because your brain would be so big that. Elon is someone exactly. I really appreciate as much as I think he gets shitted on online <laughs> I really appreciate the the way in which he dreams and then executes as well yeah we need people like that otherwise absolutely. we'll be stagnant exactly absolutely and we, I wouldn't like to work for him but no, 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 me either. Not me. <laughs> but but I, I have friends who have worked at SpaceX and at Tesla. <laughs> and everything they described was exactly what people say about what it's like working there. And so, yeah, I wouldn't want to work there, but I, I very much so appreciate the like, just like how sure he is when he goes on Joe Rogan's podcast and he says, within two years, we'll have a Neuralink where we could put it into someone's skull. And we could do all these things. So. I don't even doubt him after everything he's done. I'm like, yeah, two years from now, man. <laughs> he gets shit done, and then he's he's rational. For how visionary he might seem, he's very rational in the decisions he makes. Yeah. He's, a, he's an engineer. One of the questions he posed to him was so. like, hey, man, you have all the money uh, in the world. Why don't... Because at the, at the moment, I think he's the second richest man on the planet after Bezos. Um, but it was like, why don't you build yourself one of those like crazy hundred million dollar homes? And he said that the reason behind why he does not is because the time that it would take for him to do all of the like choosing things for what to build in the house and the blueprints and the tiles, he was just like, I have things to do like building rockets instead. And I was just like, that's the most, that's the most gangster ever. Like, like what? He like, he literally like, just like to the point of like how he's just so logical is that he did an opportunity cost of like building rockets versus like building a home. <laughs> oh, but people, people gave exactly. Mark Zuckerberg, oh, sorry, um, no, okay, guys. people gave Mark Zuckerberg so much slack for saving time by weighing up the opportunity cost of picking new socks every day oh gosh <laughs> but but he's not as that's why he wears the same socks and trousers <laughs> he's not as he's not as charismatic in in those ways i mean you see it when he's had to like go to like on court, court. yeah like you just see it like oh yeah no 100 yeah so i think that's part of it yeah, is like that's why he catches more slack is like elon elon like has force behind some of the ridiculous things he says to the point where you're just like Ah oh, man, it's Elon. Whatever. I think um, if, if uh, <laughs> yeah, one true. thing um, I'd like to end on away from the the, the technology side, or although the idea of different metaverses, um, I think they they will interconnect. And similarly, uh, the last word on blockchain would be there's not going to be one kind of big winner in the blockchain. There's going to be many blockchains that suit different use cases in different ways and they will speak to each other. And so we'll be able to move from blockchain to blockchain without the average user worrying about that. And I think for, for me, taking away the tech part, the exciting part about all of this coming together, metaverse terminology, blockchain technology, all of that is that your, your average user, they're going to see themselves owning the same asset across all these different physical and virtual realms. Um, I, my partner's younger brother is 16. 
and he owns a pair of cactus jacks worn by Travis Scott. And he never wears them, he never takes them outside the house because you know, they're hugely valuable. Yeah. But how does he show them off? Um, <laughs> and you know, we're going to see very, very soon, um, I would say definitely within the next two years, owning your know, physical goods, having a digital twin as token that then means when you open up Snapchat, you have a filter and you can wear the digital version through the Snapchat filter. You can jump into Fortnite and you can run around wearing those digital seekers in Fortnite. Um, maybe in your Neuralink, you'll be able to summon them up to compare them against other physical goods in an e- e-commerce shop. That That is just around the corner and uh, change comes very quickly. So I think for, for, any, for anyone listening, that's, uh, that's the exciting thing to look forward to. Your goods are going to be everywhere and your identity is going to be everywhere you choose to take it. I'll give you a word for that. We'll call it trans metaverse. Yeah, I've been using just interoperability, (laughs) but I like trans metaverse. (laughs) I want something new. Sorry. (laughs) Cool. Thank you so much, guys. It's been a real pleasure and uh, mind blowing. Yeah, thank you. uh, Yeah. I couldn't have imagined. So thank you so much. Thanks again. You're welcome. Bye. Thanks, guys. Thanks, everyone. Bye. Speak to you soon.